access to shared media, and then routing is here as a network layer, uh, and transport layer deals with transmission and flow of and then application layer. So this is all uh, as divided in this in this uh, uh, in this functions. Uh, but uh, of course, this is not. We don't have to do it this way, right? So in the network information theory, for instance, uh, you're not tied to this uh, restriction, right? You can just design everything in a, in a joint optimal way. Uh, but but this is useful uh, to you know in practice that that's how it has been done. And uh, and if you think. Uh, what network coding is really saying uh, is that even if you uh, respect the separation into layers, okay, even if you uh, uh, respect that, then uh, the, the function of the network layer still it can be improved. Okay? It's not optimal idea and it can be improved by allowing packet mixing. Uh, so, so I think that that's one of the the the, the properties of network coding that uh, perhaps distinguish uh, it uh, from other uh, network information theory you know, programs in general. Because it somehow tries to respect this layer separation principle. So we we'll see some applications that I'll take this into account. Uh, and, uh, and by the way, uh, that's probably one of the reasons that network coding evolved uh, so fast in the in the first uh, years, it's because since it uh, respected the, the, the layer separation principle, people could just use take the idea, change some uh, some function of some layer, uh, and uh, and just transform that into an application. Okay, so that it uh, uh, it had a very very fast exponential growth in the first uh, years since its introduction. Uh, so let's see an example. Okay? Uh, this is the so-called butterfly network, um, and uh, it, com it has a source and two destinations. And the problem here is uh, the multicast problem. So uh, the source wants to transmit uh, some information simultaneously to these two destinations. Okay, this is a network uh, we're assuming that uh, is a narrow free. Okay, all links are error free and uh, and they have a unit capacity so you can send one packet per time slot uh, and then the direct these are direct links so traffic can only flow in one direction okay, so suppose you have this problem here what's the highest rate that you can multicast to the to destination so uh, with the current uh, error of routing right you can only uh, the best you can do is the following so uh, suppose the source is split the data into two packets A and B, so you can send packet A through these links, packet B through these links. Uh, but at this node, you have to make a choice, right? You're receiving two packets and you can only transmit one. So you can, let's say, send packet A, uh, and then this destination gets A and B, uh, but this other one only gets A, so you have to use another time slot perhaps to send B to these links here, and then another packet C, uh, so that the both of them get three packets. Okay. So overall, we get uh, uh, 1.5 packets per time slot. the way that you can achieve different routes. Okay, note that this is already uh, an improvement over the, the, the actually uh, current uh, Way that this is, this is done, right? So, so currently you would just use these two uh, paths here to send one packet uh, per time slot to each user. So this is already you're already duplicating packets here and getting something uh, uh, you know some higher rate. But but uh, still packets were not uh, changed, right? So that's uh, the best you can do with route. But with network coding, you can do better. So. Uh, suppose you send packet A and B to this link. Now at this node, what you can do is just uh, do an XOR of the two packets. So it's a modular two sum. Okay? So imagine these are bits, and then you just uh, add in more mod two uh, to create this new packet here. 
And now this node can then forward this, uh, this mixed packet to the destination. And now T1, uh, since it uh, has packet A and receives A plus B, it can figure out T. Combine with the The purple ones, okay, if I can combine. Uh, what would happen if you can combine then this a big node, big node would just be able to send B here and A here, right? So the, the fundamental uh, uh, limitation here is that you just have this one link. Right? And, uh, Two packets, but you can use, use one. Yeah. So, so then, uh, um, you know, if you send this X4, then this packet is useful both to this node and to this node. Simultaneously useful to both. Does that make sense? Okay. So then you can get two packets per time slot, which is indeed the, the highest you can achieve. Okay, is that clear to everybody? Uh, okay, uh, so let's see another example. Uh, is the problem of two unicasts. So suppose, uh, it's, a, it's just a variation of that. So you have a source, S1, that wants to transmit a packet to destination T1, and similarly S2 wants to transmit T2 uh, to this network. And uh, again, with routing, you can just since you have to use this link here, right? So in one time slot you can send packet A, and in another you, you need another time slot to send packet B to the to the second destination. Right? But with network coding you can just do the previous thing. So uh, you send this uh, A plus B here, uh, and uh, of course you need some kind of side information here. So so the node T1 is not interested in B, right? But previously it can get B and then subtract the fact that it's really interested in it, which is A and similarly for T2. Okay, so you still have this extra uh, links here you can make use of this. Um, and uh, another example is the case of a wireless network. So this is uh, typically called the, uh, the two-way relay channel. So you have two users here. Uh, they want to exchange a packet. Okay, they just want to transmit packet to two, and node two wants to transmit a packet to node one. But they are out of reach, and so they communicate through a relay. Uh, so with the with just routing, uh, so this is the current uh, um, paradigm, you just so the the first node sends a packet to the relay. And then the relay uh, forwards this to, to node two. Two time blocks already, right? So in the third time block, uh, node two sends a packet to the relay, and the relay forwards it to node one. So overall, we can exchange a packet with uh, uh, four time blocks. Uh, but with network coding, what you can do is first, again, a node sends a packet to the relay, but then the relay stores that packet. And then node 2 sends a packet to the relay, and now the relay can do the summation of the packet. Uh, so you can see there's a mod to summation, right? And then just broadcast that packet simultaneously to both nodes. That's something you can do in a wireless right? uh, So overall, you can achieve uh, this exchange with three time slots. Okay, so these are all very related examples, but shows that um, you can use that to go in many different settings. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, so uh, let's start with uh, a little bit of the theory behind. Um, so we'll start with the, with the formulation for the multicast problem, uh, which is, uh, was the, 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 the main problem that was studied in the was originally proposed. So uh, when we have so the model is we have a network 
uh, it's modeled by a directed graph with uh, a link capacity, so this specifies the, the maximum number of packets that you can send to the link. And uh, it has a single source node and multiple destination nodes. And uh, we're asking uh, what is the multicast capacity, which is the maximum rate at which you can transmit uh, info information from the source simultaneously to all destination nodes. Okay? Uh, and then a useful concept here is that of an ST cut. So an ST cut is a set of edges or links right, that, uh, when removed, make the, the destination T unreadable <coughs> from S. Okay, so for instance, in this case, these three uh, uh, links form an ST cut because if you remove them, you cannot use T from S. Uh, and, and typically, we talk about the capacity of a cut, which is, in this case, is three, is the summation of the capacity of uh, the links in the cut. Uh, so it's very intuitive that uh, the, the flow, the amount of information that you can transmit is limited by the capacity of a cut. Right? Um, I, mean, I think this is just, this is essentially a, a, a special case of the cuts that bound in information theory. I think you should expect that the, the, the multicast capacity is limited by um, the minimum cut between a source and a destination. What is surprising here is that this bond is actually achievable. See, so this is exactly the most capacity and the minimum cut amount from a destination to from a source to all destinations. Take the minimum of those. Uh, that is achievable by using network coding over um, sufficiently long alpha. Uh, and that as we have seen before, that's not always a few with routing along. Uh, it's interesting that Alves Vedas was one of the uh, authors uh, uh, called this the Shannon's Mystery Theorem in the 2006 uh, Shannon lecture because Shannon had actually uh, worked on the unicast problem, the single destination problem, which is, uh, which is known in red theory as the max flow mean cut theorem. So this is a generalization of that theorem. So she worked on that, but somehow missed uh, the generalization. Uh, so just to be sure, okay, let's let's revisit the the, the butterfly network. Uh, clearly, here the mean cut from S to T one is two, and also from S to T two is two. So the multicast effect must be. Okay. We have already seen the solution. Okay. Uh, now, this is all theoretic, right? We can. Uh, uh, this is an information theoretic result. You can. It's an achievability result. You can achieve uh, that capacity. Uh, but how do you do that? Right? So, uh, this the result uh, is based on using general functions, so general mapping from pack, input packets to output packets without necessarily any structure on that. But for practical applications, we need much more structure, we need uh, something much easier to, to implement. So, uh, so then comes the idea of linear network coding, which is a, a main idea here. Uh, and, uh, and it's like uh, the following. So first of all, we assume that all the packets transmitted in the network are vectors of a certain length L uh, with symbols over a finite field FQ. This is a, that's a, a, one basic assumption. So we take, we start with this structure. Uh, packets are vectors over a finite field. And then uh, the functions that are allowed to be computed by the internal nodes are linear functions. So a node can uh, construct a new pack here by taking a linear combination of the packets it receives. You can do A1 times T1 and so on, where this coefficient are chosen from the final uh, view. So that's linear network coding, and uh, it's uh, uh, important, an important result is that linear network coding is sufficient to achieve the multicast capacity. 
if the true size is sufficiently large. Okay. So even though net recording can be used for other problems uh, besides multicast, it's always useful to you know uh, make sure that the, the uh, uh, we can all we can always uh, achieve we, we don't lose the optimality for the multicast problem okay, by doing this this uh, refinement of net recording. Uh, so. So this is the basic idea of linear net recording, taking linear operations. It's useful to view uh, this in a matrix perspective. So let's assume that the packets produced by the source are x1 to xn, so these are vectors uh, over time here. And, uh, and let's suppose the packets received by some stations are y1 to yn. Uh, so, so since these are all linear operations, then a linear combination of a linear combination is a linear combination, and then we can write uh, the, the received packets as a function of the uh, original packets uh, as, as this matrix multiplication. Right? So this is this matrix is called the transfer matrix of the network. And then uh, with this we can see that decoding, so recovering the original packets from the received packets, it just solving a linear system which is something we can do if this matrix has rank n. So another question is how do you figure out this, uh, the, these coefficients here, right, so that you can achieve uh, uh, your goal. Uh, so there are algorithms to do that, but they require knowing the whole network topology, uh, which may not be practical. So another important improvement here uh, is the idea of random linear network coding, which is just uh, uh, letting nodes choose coefficients uh, uniformly at random and independent. Okay? So just, just choose the coefficients at random. Uh, that is a you know, completely distributed solution. And the good thing is that it achieves the multicast capacity uh, with high probability if the field is sufficiently large. Right? So this, this reminds us of uh, the random coding arguments in information theory. Right? Just, just take a random code and uh, with high probability that is good, uh, provided something grows. Right? And in this case here, uh, is the field size that has to grow for this argument, argument to, to work. Uh, So a question that you may ask is how do you actually uh, decode, right? You have to now, now the matrix is random, so how do you figure out uh, and, and, and decode? So that's, that's easy to do. If you can tolerate a little bit of overhead, then on each packet you can send a unit vector as a header, so, such that the transmitted matrix is prepended by this identity matrix, and then when it is multiplied by the transfer matrix, it records the transfer matrix here in a header, and then you can use it to solve the system. And a, a, a practical way to, to do this is actually just to perform a Gaussian elimination on the receiver matrix to convert it to reduce the row echelon form, so that you just get the identity matrix here, and you can read out the data on the payload portion of the packets. So this makes uh, network coding much practical, but still that's not enough uh, to, to really be useful for uh, the, the networks <coughs> that we have in practice. So, so the results here, they typically assume that you have a directed acyclic network with, uh, without delays uh, and that is synchronous, uh, but in practice networks are much more complicated. So an important, another important improvement was, uh, was this paper by Chow and others on practical uh, random linear network coding. So uh, they gave a, a, a formulation of, of random network coding that's uh, pretty much what we see in practice. Uh, so, so basically the first thing is that you assume that each node has a buffer and it stores the packets that it receives. Uh, 
So that can deal with the synchronous, uh, asynchronous in the network. And uh, moreover, uh, whenever a node has a transmission opportunity, what it does, it, it and then takes a random linear combination of all the packets that are stored in it, <coughs> and then sends it out. Uh, so this is for this essentially specify the transmission from all nodes, right? You don't have to worry about uh, 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 you know delays, whatever you do when you you receive some packets and you still don't have a, a, an opportunity to transmit, just store them in the buffer and then whenever you can handle it, you can random in the combination. Uh, as for the receiver, the receiver can just wait uh, uh, for a sufficient number of innovative packets. So the receiver just keeps receiving uh, and as soon as it gets n linearly independent packets, you can then uh, solve the system and recover the, the original packets. Okay, so you don't have to worry at all. It just receives, uh, uh, let's say you receive n packets and the matrix is not full rank. Okay, so you would think that's a failure, right? But it's no problem. You just wait a little bit more until you receive a uh, uh, sufficient number of packets that make the matrix uh, full rank and then you can decode. Okay, so from end to end, uh, this looks like a, a, a rate list code. Okay, it's much, uh, much more practical. Uh, in particular, you don't have to worry so much about the field size. It doesn't have, doesn't have to be extremely, extremely big. Uh, typically, a, a practical choice is 2 to the 8. Okay, so that's a easier, um, uh, uh, Efficient variety in the possible transmitted packets. Another uh, contribution here uh, is, is the idea of uh, earliest decoding. So let me just give you an example here of how this could uh, this could uh, uh, work in practice. Uh, so suppose the destination receives a packet here. So I'm just uh, writing this this received matrix, you know, as as we go. Uh, so it has received one packet. This is the header and this is the payload of the packet. And then first thing you do, you convert this to, to uh, a reducible echelon form. So you just put off the elimination. So one. And then you keep doing this with all packets received. Right? And then at uh, this point here, you had a, a redundant packet, right? the packet that's in the linear space of the previous packet. So you just Ignore it. Right? And then after you finally receive uh, all the, the, the packets that you need, then you can uh, recover the information. Okay. Uh, and uh, another another important contribution of this work was uh, the reduction of complexity. So it turns out that. If you mix uh, a, 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 a very large number of packets, uh, that increases delay, that increases also the overhead in the header, right? and it also increases complexity because then you have to solve a huge linear system. So they propose the idea of uh, splitting packets into generations, uh, and then the rule is that only packets from the same generations can be mixed the network and then this uh, is able to reduce the complexity because if you just make uh, a smaller number of packets then you're solving smaller systems. Uh, and it's interesting to think this as uh, multiple parallel uses of matrix channel. Right? So, so for each generation you have a, a matrix channel like this and all these generations can go one after another or in parallel your network. So these are, I think, the basic ideas uh, that made network coding uh, practical. Right? So this was already in 2003, just three years after the original introduction. And, and then after that, many applications came. Uh, so for instance, we have we could have a network coding on the application layer. So uh, for, for instance, for 
uh, communication over peer-to-peer -peer networks. That wasn't uh, an application by uh, peer. Uh, in that case, network coding is useful to facilitate uh, cooperation between nodes. Uh, so the idea there is that uh, suppose suppose you split a file into many uh, pieces, right? And everybody has a few pieces of the file and they're, and they're trying to to, to share. Uh, and so a problem there is that you have to know which piece of the file your peer needs to receive that you have. Right? So they have to exchange this kind of uh, information uh, before they can actually cooperate. So with network coding, that becomes much easier <coughs> because you don't have to know which pieces uh, your, your peer doesn't have. You just send a random linear combination and that's very likely to be used. So that's, uh, that, that was an application of that. Recording their applications in all, uh, all layers of the protocol stack. Uh, we have seen already uh, the applications in the link and network layer, right? For wireless networks, for instance. But it's also useful to, uh, to exploit this broadcast property. And, uh, and and, 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 uh, and also you can use uh, corporate diver diversity, which is the use of multiple paths to uh, help deal with, uh, with packet erasures. And uh, in that case, network coding is also useful to uh, facilitate cooperation because you can just send random linear combinations. You don't have to, you don't have to coordinate between users exactly what to transmit. Uh, and another uh, whole application area is that of physical layer network coding where you also use the multiple access property of the medium uh, uh, to do network coding. So we'll, we'll talk about that later on. And there are many other applications such as in network computing. So computing functions of sources. Uh, uh, destination wants to compute a function of, of multiple sources and you can use network coding to help with, with that. And also distributed storage, so that's a topic that's becoming uh, popular and network coding can also be used in, in that setting. Okay, so these are some uh, 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 general um, uh, application areas, so I didn't want to go into detail into each of them, but if you're interested you can ask me to talk uh, more about that. Uh, any questions so far? Okay. So now, uh, so this is the basic, right? Now I'm going to focus on the uh, more specific problem that actually help happens in uh, if network coding is used in any layer. Um, There's an intrinsic problem uh, of the use of network coding which is the problem of error correction, or actually error propagation. So basically what happens is that mixing packets can increase error propagation. So for instance, suppose you have this network here, which is source and left position, and, uh, and a corrupt packet arrives. Okay, just some packet. So what is a, a good packet, non-corrupt packet? It's just a packet that is a linear combination of the original packets, right? So this, such packets can be used. But a packet that is not a linear combination is definitely uh, uh, corrupt. It could be uh, introduced by perhaps some imperfection in error detection at the lower layer, or uh, actually intentional jamming by a malicious user. So just suppose this, this you know, user is, uh, is malicious to disrupt communication. So it could uh, just send a, a bad packet, just some uh, uh, garbage packet. And what happens then? It turns out that this packet will be mixed with others and essentially pollute all the packets that are listening to like you see. Right, so that, so how, how do you handle this problem? So, the way we do, we can model uh, the this, uh, transmission of a corrupt packet as uh, 
the addition of some air back into some genuine packet that will be transmitted on that link. <coughs> uh, in that case, uh, a model like this, then we can express the matrix of received packets as uh, this the so, uh, equation here. So it's uh, there is a multiplication of the original packets by some transfer matrix A uh, that would uh, occur in the absence of errors. But the errors now they would uh, create this effect here because each added error packet would also uh, go to the network and so for linear combinations and so on. So you can express its influence on the best, the received back to the destination by this uh, linear equation here. Uh, so <coughs> if you assume that at most t error packets are introduced, right, then this matrix Z, which is uh, this transfer matrix from the error packet times the actual error packet to have rank at most t, right? because it just has t columns, t rows, and, uh, the, the product will have at most rank t. So this is something that we will assume. So this is, it will be the, uh, the channel law that we will uh, consider. <coughs> So this is a matrix channel, uh, and uh, to address this problem, we'll take an adversarial approach. So we'll assume that, this is a worst case approach, okay? so we'll assume that there's an adversary that knows the transfer matrix, and uh, also knows the your transmitted <coughs> matrix, and can arbitrarily choose uh, both the transfer matrix and uh, this error matrix Z. Okay, so uh, it's an omniscient adversary because it knows everything that it needs to know. And it can also choose arbitrarily this, uh, the, the influence of the channel. Uh, the only thing that we assume is that the transfer matrix has a sufficiently large rank, so it has ranks uh, at least n minus mu. So you can think of mu as a rank coefficient of this transfer matrix. Uh, and, uh, and we assume that this error matrix Z has rank at most T. So we're somehow limiting the influence of this adversary. But other than that, the adversary is free to do whatever he wishes. And uh, th this, is, this is a natural model because, as we saw, earlier, uh, this could be a malicious user, right? So it could be uh, intentionally trying to disrupt your communication. So what we want to do with the design of code, so it's a subset of the, the possible transmitted matrices, <coughs> such that uh, your transmitted matrix can now be determined uh, if the receiver, by the receiver, uh, regardless of A and Z, okay? So the adversary can do whatever it wishes and you still are able to, to figure out the, the transmitted matrix. We'll also make uh, some, uh, uh, some definitions here. So if the receiver has access to the, transmit, the transfer matrix A, we'll call this, a chan this channel coherent. Otherwise, it's a non-coherent channel. Okay, so in practice, this would be non-coherent because we're just taking random linear combinations for the volume, but it's useful also to consider the coherent problem. Uh, and uh, of course, we assume that the transmitter never knows this error matrix Z because it's chosen by the adversary. Okay, so far so good. Does it make sense? This problem? Okay. Uh, so the approach we'll take here, so let's take a little more abstract approach uh, and let's talk about adversarial channels. So 
So a number generator channel uh, consists of an input alphabet, uh, an output alphabet, and this uh, uh, fan offsets, which are the possible outputs given certain input. Okay? And the idea is that the adversary is able to choose uh, whatever, any output within this fan offset. Uh, that's up, up to the adversary to choose. You can only choose the input and the adversary choose the output uh, in the set B. Okay, that's, uh, that's our formulation of an adversary channel. You can select that arbitrarily knowing your input. And uh, what we want to do, we want to design a code, so we want to limit this number of possibilities here, such that uh, you can always decode, right? so, uh, you can always, uh, by looking at y, uh, you can figure out x okay, for every possible x in that code. Okay, so you can always, uh, uh, you, know, you can communicate without any error or uncertainty. And uh, we have to do it like this because if there is any a uh, possibility for ambiguity here. So you send uh, an X, receive an Y, and uh, maybe there were two uh, 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 codes that would uh, produce the same uh, output, then you you have a, a, an ambiguity. You don't know which was transmitted. Right? Because the adversary, and the adversary can always choose uh, uh, something here, okay, if there is a possibility for ambiguity, okay, if these two fan offsets intersect, then the adversary can always choose something in the middle of you, and that, that will confuse you, if you don't know which uh, of them was present. Uh, so, so then uh, we say that a code is reliable for an adversarial channel if uh, this intersections never appear. Okay, so whatever, so you choose uh, a subset of uh, inputs here such that their outputs are always, uh, output sets are always destroyed. Okay, that then you have a reliable code. Uh, and of course, if you have a reliable code, then you can always decode it, right? You just take the unique paths that, uh, that uh, can produce that. Make sense? Okay. So let's keep some examples, uh, and these examples are, uh, are related to classical coding <coughs> theory. So actually, I hope you will see that uh, this formulation of adversarial channels can actually be used as a foundation for classical coding theory. So for instance, suppose we have uh, an adversarial channel, uh, it's a vector channel where the adversary can introduce at most t errors, okay? So we can change at most t symbols of a vector, uh, so a vector of length n. So we can uh, represent the adversarial channel like this. So uh, you send a vector, you receive a vector that is your transmitted vector but, uh, added to this uh, error vector z, and the weight, the hemming weight of that vector is at most t, and the adversary can choose whatever error vector to have. So that's, that's exactly, that's a channel that introduces at most t uh, symbol errors. You can also uh, think of uh, uh, a channel that introduces also erasures. So how do we model that? So that's a new erasure t error channel. So besides the possible T errors uh, modeled by this uh, addition of a, a vector Z, you could also have some coordinates that are just erased. Okay, so just multiply, let's say, by a zero, uh, but uh, the receiver knows which coordinates were erased. Okay, so that's uh, a channel with the new, at most mu erased and at most T errors. And we're assuming that the adversary can choose, arbitrarily choose where to place the erasures and where to place 
this error to reach them, to introduce them. Okay? The interesting thing here is that uh, you know, we will ask what are the reliable codes for this channel? You know, which codes uh, enable you to communicate over such uh, channels? And so, so we're looking for some kind of characterization of the good codes, the reliable codes. And it turns out that this can, uh, such codes can be completely characterized by, by a single number, which is the minimum handling distance of the code. Right? So that's a result we see in every classical coding theory book. So we see that, so first of all, uh, we define the handling distance and the minimum handling distance of Code, and then uh, uh, we can see that a code is reliable for this channel with new operations and t errors if and only if the minimum handling distance of the code is strictly greater than new plus two t. Right? So we see in every coding theory book. Uh, and what does this tell us? is that we can, at this point, when we have such a characterization, this if and only if result, we can completely forget about the channel, right? Just throw away the channel and just focus on finding codes that have uh, a certain uh, minimum distance and, of course, are the largest ones possible. So, uh, increase their rate by uh, largest So, a code with uh, uh, more codebooks, a right? large number of codebooks, because you can always create a reliable code with single codebook, but then you cannot tra really transmit information, right? You transmit information by uh, choosing from a set of possible methods. So, what's the Yeah, the rate of code. So, there's no probabilistic notion of this adversarial? No probabilistic notion. And how does, that's the and how does this? So it's, it's a completely different uh, approach, right? Uh, so for our problem, as I mentioned, this could be, you could really have an adversary here, right? Uh, so an adversary doesn't do anything, necessarily it doesn't do anything probabilistic or random. You can just choose the worst possible uh, influence to, to, uh, to defeat you. Uh, so we, we really need this adversarial approach for this natural coding problem. As for classical coding theory, it's uh, it's interesting to think about this because just look at the, the story, right? The story is that uh, you have uh, uh, this probabilistic channel, uh, and then uh, you know that uh, uh, the best thing to do is maximum likelihood decoding, and then you show that maximum likelihood decoding is equivalent to minimum distance decoding. But then you, then you say, oh, minimum distance decoding is too hard. Let's just do uh, bounded distance decoding. And then if you're doing bounded distance decoding, then the best thing to do is to find code with a large minimum I mean distance, right? But then come turbo codes and LDBC codes and tell you that you can do better by using, uh, you know, by using this probabilistic decoding uh, and achieve capacity and so on. So I think what happens is that classical coding theory is trying to solve a different problem. It's actually an adversarial problem. And then you can argue whether this adversarial problem fits your real channel, right? your real problem. But, uh, but if you really think, you know, the solution you have with classical coding theory is really a solution for this worst case adversarial problem. Because you have to uh, limit the influence of the adversary somehow, right? If the adversary can introduce any number of errors, then you cannot communicate. And so uh, the 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 in, the I don't know, the consequence of that would, would be that you have to design your system in such a way that the adversary is limited. So I think this, this adversary or 
thing is weaker than the probabilistic one. Because in the other one, you say that on average, I have tiers, which you might have t plus 1. And in this case, your system cannot do anything about that one. While the, the real channel coding can, can resolve that one because you know the, you, are, you don't have perfect codes. You have codes that you don't actually solve the minimum time distance, but you are solving maximum likelihood, which can actually resolve the issue here. So the thing is that you are just making the problem simpler because we want to use maximum time distance. Uh, no, 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 in some sense, right. right. Because <laughs> the t plus root t error, I mean, the, the, you, you might have t, but you might have t plus so root t. You are, you are, no, you are defining the knowledge probabilities for the system by changing that probability one to this. No, no, it's not it's not yeah, this is this is not probabilistic. This is if this works in probability, this works. And this in probability is concentration. This is much much harder. Yeah, this is much much harder than. Yeah, I wouldn't say that you know the problem is easier than. This is the problem. This is the problem. In that case, in that probability, any tier fragment will be used. No, that's true. Yeah, you are saying that he can, for instance, mimic a probability submission. But he can only do that if he can introduce any number of errors. He will limit it so the the issue really with probabilistic channels is not about uh, finding a new code, but actually it's only efficient. It can modify the transformation uh, provided the rank is uh, three and one in the Yes, yes. Again, if it can just uh, choose any matrix A, it will just choose A equal to zero and <laughs> then But of course you can see that these are uh, are very related to erasures and errors in the, in the vector channels. Right? Could you, you assuming that you know A, right? You're using because the, 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 this, is a, this is a coherent channel, yes, yes. you know A. Any other polemic questions? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so the point here is that if you have this characterization, then you can just focus on finding codes with uh, you know, large codes with a certain distance and it's getting you know, about upper and lower bounds and instructions and so on. So that's what I believe would be a foundation for classical coding theory. Uh, now what about the network coding problem? So, so let's start with the coherent channel. Okay, so, so that's the channel. The transmitted matrix is multiplied by A and then added by Z. Uh, again, the rank of A is limited from below, the rank of C is limited from above. Uh, and note that the receiver knows the transformation A. You can assume that too. Okay? Just, let's just assume that problem. Uh, it turns out that the same kind of characterization can be done here. So we define the rank distance between two matrices. It's the rank of the distance of the matrices, and then we can also define the minimum rank distance of the code. And then it turns out that uh, we can characterize the reliable codes for that channel. So I'm calling that the coherent new T rank adversarial channel. So when you see new and T, you know what they mean, right? So mu, mu is the rank efficiency. The, the, maximum rank of C to A and C the maximum rank of Z. So the, the reliable codes for this channel are those that have a minimum rank distance strictly greater than mu plus 2t. This is an if and only if result. Uh, if 
if the minimum rank distance is greater, then the code is reliable. If it is not, then it's unreliable, which means that the adversary can find a way to always defeat you. Uh, if you're interested, I can show you the proof of this. Uh, so, by having this characterization, it means that we can forget about the channel and just focus on finding codes with a certain uh, minimum rank distance. It's interesting to point out that the rank distance is also a metric, just like uh, any distance is also a metric. Uh, there is a single tone bound, so there's an upper bound uh, for the size of codes with the rank metric. And actually, there are codes that achieve this single tone bound. These codes are called uh, maximum rank distance codes. So note that this is very uh, unlike uh, the classical case, right? Where it's it's uh, you cannot always find codes that achieve the single tone bound, but here this is for all every choice of parameters, uh, provided of course the uh, every choice of parameters. So these of course limited by the size of the the matrix, right? You cannot have a matrix with rank that's bigger than uh, its. Uh, the, the minimum of its dimension. So, so this is a, a, a theory by uh, several authors that uh, uh, discover these codes independently. So this is a construction of maximum rank distance codes for any choice of parameters. So these are called MRE, maximum rank distance codes. So that essentially solves the problem. <laughs> So uh, the required field size uh, for network code you need. Right? So this you need uh, large uh, fields to so that a random network coding is is. Uh, Achieve the most cast capacity with high probability, or even to, to find a network coding solution for network, even without a random. Uh, this is a different thing. So, uh, we're just looking at, uh, uh, at how to use this matrix code with this uh, distance, right? This rank distance. So, you, you can always, so this is the result, you can always find this code. Now, uh, what you're saying is that uh, maybe it's not useful to have a smaller field size because I was already using a big field size for that Yeah, Does it show that if we add some sort of redundancy, we don't have a big field size? Uh, is that true? Actually, there's an application of uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, MRD code. It's a very good observation, so we have uh, used this property. Uh, precisely to reduce the fuel size in that point. So, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that later. Any other questions? Yes. So the proof of the theorem is constructed or just a, a system? No, it is a constructor. Yeah, yes. we'll, we'll look at this construction later. Okay. So that solves the, the coherent uh, problem. Let's look now at the non-coherent problem. So it's the same thing as before, just that the receiver doesn't have access to the matrix A. How do you do it? Uh, so uh, a very uh, important observation by Cotter and Shishang is that when you have such uh, a channel, such a non-coherent channel, then you can only communicate through the row space of your transmitted matrix. And the reason is that you know, if you transmit two matrices, even they're, they're distinct matrix, but they have the same row space, then they are indistinguishable at the receiver. Because the adversary can always choose this matrix A to make them equal at the receiver. Does it make sense? You don't know, right? Because if you had access to the matrix A, then you would know what was the 
uh, no longer the adversary has changed, but but in this case, no no. So you cannot really uh, distinguish. Maybe it's just a row space. Uh, because the row space, just think in the absence of errors, the row space is distinguished, right? You, if you do uh, a matrix multiplication, if the matrix is full rank at least, uh, then you don't change the row space. So, uh, so that's the, the expression here, right? In the absence of rank errors or rank deficiency, the row space of the received matrix is exactly equal to the row space of the transmitted matrix. And so you can try to transmit information through the choice of row spaces. If you do have a rank deficiency or this addition of rank errors, then your transmitted subspace will be distorted into some other subspace. And we need to think of, you know, what's the measure of distance between subspace. So, um, but uh, before we get to that, the important thing is to notice that it suffices for us to consider a subspace code. Right? We don't have to think of matrix, matrix codes, but just subspace codes, because you can only transmit information to row space. Right? Does that make sense? Uh, so we can make an equivalent channel, an equivalent subspace channel. So uh, basically, your subspace code is this sigma here, so it's just a set of subspaces. Uh, it has it's, the, the subspace has to be limited in dimension because in the end you have to transmit through some matrix which has at most n rows. So the subspace has to be maximum, have to have maximum dimension n, uh, but just a set of subspaces. And then what you do? Uh, the transmitter just selects uh, uh, a, a subspace from that subspace code right? and transmits a matrix whose row space equals that subspace. Operation of the transmitter. <clears throat> now the receiver will receive a matrix Y and it can simply compute the row space of that receiver matrix. Right? That's that's a sufficient statistics, right? You don't you don't have to really uh, 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 you know, it doesn't matter what the matrix Y is, just its row space. Right? Because the, the adversary could have applied any uh, um, linear, non singular linear transformation. <coughs> However, we still get these limitations here, so the, the, the rank efficiency is limited, but even the rank efficiency of that is limited by T. Uh, but other than that, it's a, it's a subspace channel. And of course, a natural choice here is just taking the, the the uh, matrix that is in reduced row echelon form that generates the subspace that you want to train. So, uh, uh, so, so here will be the, our expression for uh, this equivalent subspace channel. Right? So this is the uh, matrix generating that subspace times A plus Z, and then you take the, the, the row space of that. And uh, I just want to point out, if you're familiar with the operative channel uh, uh, introduced by Cutter and Shishang, uh, the operative channel is a bit different. So there is an operator that uh, uh, somehow deletes dimensions from this subspace here, and then uh, <coughs> and then some other subspace is added, like subspace addition, uh, to the to the to this. Subspace with reducing dimensions to form the receiving subspace. So then you can talk about uh, dimension deletions and dimension insertions. So this operation does deletions and this does insertions. However, uh, so so this operator channel captures the what's happening here. 
However, it's more difficult to relate to concrete network parameters, such as number of, of error packets introduced on the network by an adversary. Because, uh, why? Because uh, uh, imagine you have a packet error. Okay, so just to have a matrix and uh, let's say you change some row of the matrix as a packet, packet error. This can lead to <coughs> an insertion of a dimension, a deletion of a dimension, right? just remove, transform everything to zero. Uh, could be also replacement of a dimension, and but could be no change, right? You just change to some other uh, <coughs> vector in the same row space. So, uh, so it's harder to to <coughs> connect this with our uh, channel model, okay, with mu and t. I'm sticking to this uh, equivalent channel, which is uh, you know is closely related to this channel model. Uh, okay, so the question now is how can we make a distance between subspaces? Yes. Sorry. How do we decide to send these subspaces? Uh, you have a set of subspaces. You can send any of them. Very beginning, we have some data, right? Oh, okay. Uh, so you, you need some kind of encoding of data into subspaces. Yeah. So that, that's uh, that's that's another problem. So here we're just looking more abstractly, right? Just postulate there is some mappings, but just a bijection from the data to the subspace. But of course, in practice, you have to do that efficiently. So that's another problem. Any questions? Okay. Uh, so can we also give a characterization of the reliable rules for this channel in terms of some distance? <coughs> uh, so Kotter and Shishen proposed the so-called subspace distance, which is uh, computed like this. So the dimension of one subspace plus the dimension of the other minus two times the dimension of the intersection of the two subspaces. It turns out that this is a precise characterization of the reliable codes for the operator channel. Okay, so if you take the minimum subspace distance of a code, of a subspace code, uh, <coughs> then you can uh, state that a code is reliable for that operator channel if and only if the minimum subspace distance is strictly greater than two times Rho plus epsilon, where rho plus epsilon are parameters of this operator channel. So that's uh, that uh, precise characterization. However, it doesn't perfectly work for the, our equivalent subspace channel from the matrix channel. So it gives you, it does give you a guarantee uh, that the code is reliable if subspace distance is strictly greater than two times mu plus two t, uh, but not doesn't give you the converse, not the only if part. Okay, <coughs> it means that a code may actually be better what better than what the subspace distance predicts. Okay, uh, so we're looking for a if and only if uh, result. So then we have to call it the injection distance uh, as a slightly different definition. So it's the, it's the maximum dimension of the of the two subspaces minus the dimension of the intersection. It's also metric. Both the subspace distance and the, and the injection distance are metrics. And now with this metric, we can give uh, precise characterization. So our code is reliable for the non-coherent beauty rank adversarial channel if and only if the injection distance is strictly due to the U plus two T. Okay, what does this mean? Uh, this injection of distance counts the minimal number of basis vectors that have to be replaced in order to change the subspace into another one. Okay. So let's give an example. Suppose you have a subspace U and you want to transform into a subspace V. Uh, how many replacements of basis vectors you have to make? 
So you can replace one dimension here, replace another dimension here, uh, and then add the three dimensions, and then you get to that subspace D. Right? This is the uh, this is a lattice of subspaces, right? They are, this is the, the sum of subspaces, this is the intersection of the two of them. So what was the first SGF? What was the SGF? The, the sub, yeah, the subspace distance. So how would we compute? It's just this dimension plus this dimension minus two times. So it's just uh, uh, the distance here on this graph. Okay? So it's just uh, five plus two is seven. Uh, so the number of uh, either insertions of deletions of dimensions, you just keep counting them to the other subspace, while the injection is about replacement. And sometimes a replacement can be just uh, a, a, an insertion of dimension or a deletion of dimension. Uh, so now suppose you have um, a channel that introduces two erasures, right? Rank efficiency two, and one error packet injected, right? So we need to two and two equals to one. So the theorem um, states that a code will be reliable if its injection distance is greater than or equal to five, and the other theorem, the guarantee from the subspace distance, guarantees that the code is reliable if the subspace distance is greater than or equal to 9. In this example, we can see, so suppose it goes just with these two codes, right? So the code is reliable because with two erasures and one uh, change, one replacement of the measure, right? You can only, you cannot go to, uh, you cannot make these two Coders here go into the same received subspace. Okay, so if you go from this one, you can do two deletions of dimensions here, and one replacement you get here. And uh, with one replacement you get here, one deletion you get here. So these two points are still distinct, right? So you cannot confuse uh, a transmitter that has these two. Uh, but the the guarantee of the subspace distance would uh, does not satisfy this case, right? Because the subspace distance is just seven. And the guarantee requires nine. Uh, so that's uh, an example of this only if result. And uh, just uh, to clarify a little bit more, suppose you had one more erasure. Right? So you could you could then confuse the transmitter because with three erasures and one error, you can uh, uh, replace this dimension, delete the one, you reach this point, and uh, by deleting three, you reach this, and replacing one, you reach this uh, goal, you can get to this subspace going either from U or B. So then you can make the, the receiver uh, confused about what was Let's just, I'm going to just make one important observation here, uh, is that if we're uh, restricted to codes that have a constant dimension, so the codes on the so-called Brazilian, which is a set of all subspaces from the vector space that have a certain dimension n, uh, then the two uh, distances become equivalent. One is just two times the other. So for that uh, special case of constant dimension codes, the subspace distance is equivalent. You can use uh, either one. Uh, and uh, it makes sense to do that because uh, using non-constant dimension codes is actually quite hard to track. Uh, and also, uh, and also, they're harder also to uh, to study. Uh, however, this injection system has been used, for instance, uh, to to find codes for error correction with multiple sources. You need uh, this this uh, this injection system, and 
even in that case, this can be considered as a proof that the subspace distance gives you this if and only if result. Uh, I mean, just mention before we we stop. Uh, what would be the problem now once we have this characterization of reliable codes, reliable subspace codes under this uh, distance function? I, it's just finding the largest codes with a given uh, injection distance. Right? If you look at constant dimension or codes or codes with a maximal dimension. Uh, this is a very loose upper bound. And uh, there's also a construction. So a construction that is based on rank metric codes. So a fundamental result is this one. Suppose you take a rank metric code here, C, and construct a subspace code from that matrix code just by preparing an identity matrix and then taking the rows. Okay? If you do that, then uh, it turns out the injection distance of the subspace code is exactly equal to the rank distance of the code. So what does square This one here? No. This one. Yeah. Uh, okay, so and this is because you have you can have two problems, right? Ah. If you're looking for a constant dimension, those are close to the maximum dimension. So yes. this bound here just changes in uh, that. Okay, so if you construct in this way we have called as lifting, lifting a, a matrix code to a subspace code, turns out this, this, this the subspace, the injection distance uh, uh, is equal to the rank distance. So it gives you a practical way to construct subspace codes. And more than that, if the, the you're lifting MRD codes, uh, then it turns out that the cardinality here of the subspace code that you generate is very close to the this upper bound. So uh, asymptotically, uh, we can say that this lifted MRD code is uh, You know, if by using a more sophisticated tools, uh, using best being tools, uh, one have been able to construct uh, better codes than these uh, lifted uh, MRD codes. Definitely, 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 yes. yes. Oh, yeah. So I'm just uh, mentioned that they have some asymptotic optimality. Okay. okay. Right? But uh, so for engineering purposes, uh, this would be you know uh, uh, pretty much enough. But from a mathematical standpoint, then uh, there's a lot you can do to improve this code and, and try to reach uh, the upper bound. So this is this, this the whole area on the, on the writing codes on the grid And that's just a confirmation some of the, the results uh, on that area. And most of them, by the way, just uh, uh, take start with uh, this lifted MRD codes and then increase, add more code loops to make uh, a better code. So uh, I'm going to stop here. I guess it's uh, already going on now. Uh, but uh, I have just a few more slides on uh, on the this, uh, air control problem, and then we talk about the physical air problem.
but you can all you can always increase too much because you're not doing really mixing or anything. So, um, so so then you can start the optimal generation size for for specific problems. Okay, but in practice we see uh, uh, the gener the the generation size is eight to two hundred in practice. But it's it's an interesting problem. Any other questions? Just a remark, because uh, it makes me, uh, it makes me think about uh, what has been done in 2000 about the money for the career and uh, And there was also this kind of scheme that has been proposed in that case. Code in the Yeah, and also you know these uh, coherent codes plus the identity being this, uh, it was the channel. So it's, uh, it's There's a connection to yeah, the codes. Yeah, paper from the um, uh, Gamara thing. Uh, not this construction by using the weird codes. Yeah. It's uh, very simple. But by using complex samples, it's quite uh, simple. Yes. Yeah, that's the, the big difference. Right? Yeah, yes, exactly. And uh, the final fields, you don't have uh, like energy of the yeah, yeah. Uh, different <laughs> concepts. Yeah. Uh, but, but there is some relation. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, any other comments or questions?